Amen. Let us honor our fallen loved ones as you are seated. Amen. Amen. Friends, you've heard the scripture read into your hearing. We have a thesis verse for you to offer in the ninth verse of Luke chapter 23, verse 9. The scripture says, He questioned him at some length. But Jesus gave no answer. Underline these words in your Bible. But Jesus gave no answer. Providence and all of her guests, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you briefly this morning on the subject of we need to pay our premiums. We need to pay our premiums. Brothers and sisters, last Sunday was an amazing celebration as we honored all of our young people who have graduated from high school and college and graduate school. Amen. Amen. And so as we conclude this month of May, we return to our theme of filling our spiritual bank account, which is our theme for the year. And this month, one of the financial concepts that we have been focused on is insuring. We want to live our spiritual lives in such a way that you and I will have a buffer against the inevitable difficulties that will come our way. By now, I think most of us understand how insurance works. On its very, very basic level, you and I pay a premium to receive coverage. We pay in the present that we might be covered in the future. Simply stated this Sunday, brothers and sisters, did you know there is nothing worse in the game of insurance than if you fail to pay your premiums? Nothing can be more distressing than when you get into some future calamity thinking that you have coverage from your insurance only to find out that because you did not pay your premiums, your coverage has lapsed. This Sunday, I want to investigate one of the most powerful premiums that Jesus paid throughout his ministry. This is a premium that Jesus paid to ensure that he would have proper coverage to complete the assignment God gave him to redeem humanity back unto God. To ensure that Jesus would have coverage from the creator. To ensure that he had intimate relationship with the creator. To ensure that he had compassion and wisdom and power for the creation. Jesus consistently paid the premium of silence. Silence. Blessed quietness. A hush. A stillness. A tranquility. You should know that several places in the New Testament are intended to teach us that just because you can speak doesn't mean you should. Every now and then, the best thing you can do for yourself, your family, and your God is to hold your peace. Jesus is teaching us in this particular text how Paying the premium of silence in the present can offer you coverage in the future. Silence, brothers and sisters. Silence is the complete absence of sound, where literally Jesus prohibited himself from speaking. Silence, where Jesus suppressed his own expression, and he prevented himself from making an audible sound. Jesus did it, the Bible teaches us, all in the name of maintaining power with the Creator. All in the name of maintaining connection with God and faithfulness to God. I've come this morning to tell you that silence is a premium that every one of us in here can look back over our lives and say, boy, I wish I had just stayed quiet. You and I, all of us, 
can regret things that we have said, ways that we have behaved, facial expressions that we have given. You and I, every single one of us, have made sounds that have hurt a loved one. We've made sounds that have scared a child, raised our blood pressure, or many of us have continued situations that would have died years ago if we had just been silent. There are times, Jesus is teaching us in this particular text, and in several places throughout the gospel, where by paying the premium of silence in the present, you can offer yourself and your family coverage from calamity in the future. Silence in the pressure in the present ensures that in the future you can deal with the ramifications of whatever is going on because you didn't start something yesterday that needs to be finished tomorrow. Every one of us in here, if you have any level of Jesus, has something in your life where you are saying to yourself, if only I had kept silent. The Old Testament teaches us that God met with the people of God in moments of silence. Psalm 62 reminds us that God encourages the practice of silence. And our selected text this morning demonstrates that the sinless savior of the entire universe in one of the most critical times of his life paid the premium of silence. Premiums must be paid to have insurance and one of the premiums you and I have to pay if we are going to fill our spiritual bank account is the premium of silence. Consider, if you are, where we are in the Bible. Here, I'm in Luke chapter 23, and for all intents and purposes, Jesus's earthly ministry is over. Jesus has already been arrested, and the state at this point in time is toying with him with the legal maneuvering that goes on between Pontius Pilate and King Herod before they are going to send him to a certain death through crucifixion. Jesus, by this point in time, has been wrongly accused, he's been inappropriately detained, and he's been horrifically abused. And one would think, if ever there was a time in a person's life when you ought to speak up for yourself, when you ought to defend yourself, when you should make your voice heard, this would surely be the time. Most people forget that Jesus actually was not arrested by the state. If you read the Bible closely, you will notice that Jesus was actually arrested by a mob of Jewish leaders. Literally, it was a citizen's arrest who then delivered him to the state for crucifixion. Since they were in Jerusalem, Jesus was originally brought to Pontius Pilate because Pontius Pilate was the Roman prefect or the Roman governor who was over Judea, the city where Jesus was arrested. Pilate presided over Jesus' sham of a trial until he realized that Jesus was not a Judean, but rather Jesus was a Galilean. At that time, in an attempt to cover up any jurisdictional issues that may come up, Pilate sent Jesus back to the governor of Galilee, where Jesus was from, and the Bible says that the Galilean governor just happened to be in Jerusalem at that time, and his name was Herod. This is where our Bible picks up in our selected pericope in Luke chapter 23. Verse 7 states, and when Pontius Pilate learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod. Herod, who was in Jerusalem at the time. Call it lucky, call it fortuitous, call it divine providence, but Herod was in town. The Bible says in verse 8 that when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad because he had been wanting to see him for a long time. Wait a minute. This verse should make you scratch your head just a little bit. Jesus had just completed a three-year ministry where my Bible says Jesus was not hard to find at all. The book teaches us Jesus was all over the community in Asia Minor, in Cappadocia, Jerusalem, and in Galilee. He had been in Jerusalem. He had been in the surrounding cities. But the Bible says that Herod wanted to see Jesus for a long time. Herod, you were the prefect. You were the governor. You could have come to see Jesus at any time you wanted to. The Bible is trying to teach us, brothers and sisters, that Herod's desire and want to see Jesus for some time was not a desire for Herod to go see Jesus. It was a desire for Jesus to come see Herod. 
You see, sometimes people want you to come to them to demonstrate that they have some level of a power dynamic over you. And that Jesus, in this particular text, if he would come see me, I would learn that he's not the great savior of the whole world, that he, in effect, is no different than any other one of my subjects who will come and see me and so-called kiss the ring. Jesus, never seeing Herod before, he submitted himself to arrest, had a form of silent protest against this power because of all the people Jesus went to see in his ministry, of all the people Jesus took care of in his ministry, he never went to see Herod. It was as if Jesus was saying, I have no time for the games that Herod wants to play. I have no time for the power play dynamics that Herod wants to engage in. And in the text, the first premium of silence that you see Jesus playing is that Jesus refused to go see Herod and play the games that Herod wants to play. This, brothers and sisters, is a powerful lesson in the Bible that you and I have been called to follow and obey to the will of God, not follow and obey the will of other people. I see the way you're looking at me, so I need to get real specific so you can pick up what I'm putting down. Did you know that like Herod in this text, some people in our lives love to be masters at playing games. Some people like to play games that are subtle and some people like to play games that are not so subtle. But many people that you and I deal with every day in an effort to shift power dynamics to get their way and to create and cause confusion, they like to move us like pawns on a board the same way Herod was trying to move Jesus. The thing that you ought to pick up from the text, if Jesus for three years of ministry never engaged with going to see Herod and paid him the premium of silence, then baby, you don't have to engage in the foolishness of other people either. In many cases, the games that people play are intentional acts of power. They are power plays to shift power dynamics in a friendship or relationship or a connection that they might elicit some response from you to get whatever they want from you. In the same way a master controls the feelings and the work and the being of a slave, similarly, these slave owner-like people in our minds have slave owner mindsets where they will try to control, is, to control us by the games and the foolishness that they play. And if you don't pay the premium of silence, you might not be covered from being pulled into their games in the future because you allowed yourself to be pulled into their games in the present. I see the way you're looking at me. You're still not getting it. Did you know there are some arguments you don't have to engage in? There are some text messages you don't have to respond to. There are some conversations that you don't have to stay in. There are some places that you do not have to go. If you already know what a person's objective is, if you already know the foolishness they are not trying to engage in, you do not have to play. Every now and then when someone summons you into a conversation, texts you some foolishness, or calls you with some foolishness, you have to remind yourself, you don't have a heaven or a hell to put me in, therefore I am not required to get pulled into your stuff. For three years, Herod made it known to anyone who would listen that he expected Jesus to come and see him, but Jesus actually never came and saw him. Jesus was in effect telling Herod, some of the gifts and skills that I have, some of the blessings and grace that I have are not to be wasted on people who don't want the miracle in the first place. I think you missed it. Let me say it again. Some of the gifts and skills that you have, some of the blessings and grace that you have, it's a miracle that God uses you the way that God uses you. And every now and then you got to look at some people in your life and let them know, baby, I don't waste miracles. Some of the things God is doing with me are reserved for people who have a predisposition to receive my blessing in the first place. And since I can tell you're not picking up what I'm putting down, baby, I don't have anything to say to you, so I'm just going to hush. The Bible tells us that Jesus did not come willingly during his ministry, but now Jesus is compelled to go see Herod during his arrest. The Bible says in verse 8 that Herod's claim of wanting to see Jesus was specific. He hoped to see Jesus, hoping that Jesus could perform some sign for him. So I'm in verse 9. He questioned Jesus at length like a comedian brought in to make Herod laugh, like a minstrel brought forth to bring Herod entertainment, like a magician hired to wow Herod with his magic. Herod was hoping to see some sign from Jesus. 
Herod was not interested in connecting with the king of kings or God in the flesh or the eternal verities. Herod was not interested in the things that Jesus might be able to say or the way that Jesus might be able to connect him to God or the love that Jesus might be able to give to him. Herod was not interested in what God may be doing in bringing that connection together or how God may use him in the future blessing of his life or how God may lift him up because Jesus was in his life. Herod was not interested in what God wanted to do through Jesus in his life. Herod was interested in making Jesus small. Every now and then, you need to look at the people in your life, the people that you interact with and deal with all the time, and you need to recognize that maybe you don't want to deal with me because you recognize that God wants to use me to be a blessing to you. Maybe you don't want to talk to me because of the gift and wisdom that I have that I want to share to you. Maybe you are not seeking to find out how God wants us to be connected, that we might be a blessing to other people. Maybe you are just trying to use me to make yourself feel bigger, which in turn tries to make me feel smaller. And if all you want to do is make me feel small, I must remind you that the only person in my life that I'm okay feeling small in front of is the Lord my God. Everybody else, you ain't no bigger than me. You ain't no better than me. Your breath is going to stop going in your lungs just like mine. Your body is going to turn to dust just like mine. And you are going to have to stand before God just like I am. So baby, I don't feel small in front of you at all in any way. He wanted to make a sideshow out of Jesus and maintain a power dynamic that he had over Jesus. He wanted to minimize who Jesus actually was in the community. And did you know Jesus is not the only one among us who's got a Herod in their lives? Every now and then you got to sit down and look at who are the Herods that are in your life. And you got to say to yourself, why is this person getting any of my time? my attention, or the beauty of my voice. I'm referring to people who don't see the imago dei. They don't see the image of God in you. People who are not trying to connect for the divine power of faith and love that comes from you. People that want to use you as a sideshow for entertainment purposes only. And they want to use you for their objectives of some meeting or purpose for what they want to get out of you. You're not feeling me. I see the way you're looking at me now to get specific. Did you know as long as you've been in church, you and I date people like this, we marry people like this, we work with people like this, we've got friends who are like this, we have family members who are like this, we've got neighbors who are like this, we got church members who are like this. If you go to your call log right now and look at your last 10 calls, you might find, mm mm-hmm, Herod, Herod, Herod. Herod, Herod. And the question isn't, do I have a Herod in my life? Because the Bible says Herods are everywhere. The question is, why are you talking to them? These are the people who are not in it to get the Savior. They're just in it for a sign. They don't care about the holy. They just want you for humor. They're not in it for the ministry. They just want you for the magic. All in an effort to maintain a power dynamic where they can maximize who they are on the inside and minimize who you are on the inside. And baby, I don't have time to make you feel better because you want to make me too small. Because my God said I am too big to make you feel better because I am small. When Jesus recognized that this was the game that Herod was going to play, the Bible says that although Herod questioned him at length, Jesus gave him no answer. I think you missed it in the text. Let me say it again. Herod questioned him at length. Could you imagine standing there at the time there Jesus is with a crown in his head and Herod is having a conversation with him, asking him questions, asking him to do things. And the Bible says Jesus gave him nothing. He gave him no answer. He gave him nada, nothing, Nathan. He gave him silencio, chiho, chisha, stilte. He gave him in English what you and I call silence. There are things, Herod, that you are trying to pull me into that run contrary to the purpose for which God allowed me to be arrested and crucified in the first place. And if what you are trying to do with me does not align with what God is trying to do with me, baby, I have nothing to say to you. Every now and then, your silence is not rude. Every now and then, you not responding is dis- not disrespectful. Every now and then, you've got to tell people, I'm not holy enough to respond to you in this moment. 
So the best thing for you and I is for me to stay silent and let God use me. Because every now and then you have to admit, if I respond like I want to respond, this ain't going to go well for either one of us. And since, Herod, you are so far away from where my God wants you and I to be, I'm not going to engage in that which God does not want me in. Brothers and sisters, here in the text, Jesus is recognizing how pivotal the moment is, how critical the mission of salvation is. And Jesus is putting his feet ten toes down, flat-footed, and saying, no one and nothing is going to pull me from the mission of salvation. Silence, in this case, helps Jesus stay on the course from what God has for him. Because silence of voice can be connected to stillness of mind. One of the things you have to understand in the text is every time you're speaking, you can't hear God talking. You are extremely intelligent and a gifted individual, but not near one of you in here is able to talk and hear from God simultaneously in time. And every now and then, you and I have to acknowledge the best thing I need in my life is to hear from my Savior in heaven. And since some people push you as close to God as they can get you, the best thing I should do is not respond to you so that in my silence I can hear from God. Every now and then you have to tell people, I'm not responding because I'm ignoring you. I'm not responding because I'm listening to God. I'm not responding because I'm disrespecting you. I'm not responding because I'm focusing on God. And there are some people in my life, I tell them and it hurts their feelings. But in comparison to listening to you talk or me listening to God, baby, I'm not talking to you. Rather than you and I spending time thinking about how we are going to formulate a response to the Herods in my life, you and I have to acknowledge maybe my silence allows me to listen for what God is saying. And isn't it good news that the Herods in our lives exist? Because if the Herods weren't there, there'd be nothing to push you to be still and know that he is God. These people are pushing you more towards God. And every now and then, rather than me focusing on the crazy of somebody else, I need to use their crazy, turn it around for good, and listen to the holiness of my Savior. The Bible says this worked perfectly. The Pharisees, Herod, questioned him. The chief priests had contempt for him. The scribes accused him. The soldiers mocked him. But through it all, Jesus just sat there listening to what God had to say. Through it all, Jesus kept talking to God. And every now and then, you have to ask yourself, how was Jesus strong enough to ignore these people? How was he strong enough to take the beating that he took? How was he strong enough to be crucified when he was sinless and did no wrong? And the answer is, the more you talk to God, the stronger you get. What you are buying with your silence is coverage from the Most High God. It's a coverage that will be there for you in the future to provide for you when the Herods of our lives are nowhere to be found. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most important things you have to understand about the Herods of your life. These Herods will use you up, drain you out, turn you into a tizzy, get you all emotionally crazy, and then they will walk away from you. And they will leave you worse off than when you met them in the first place. There's a fundamental difference between somebody who wants the worst from you and somebody who somewhere in his book said, I know the plans that I have for you. And they are plans not to harm you. They are plans for your future and to bless you with that which is good. Providence, you are covered by the best in God, our creator. However, sometimes we have to admit that we allow the words, actions, and deeds of other people to control us. We allow other people to impact us. We allow other people to ultimately derail us from the divine design of our creator. It's not a matter of if the Herods in your life are going to try you. It's a matter of when. And since you know the Herods are coming, Today is the day when you can begin to pray, pay the premium of silence. Because as a church community, we don't need the Herods in our lives taking us away from God. We need to pay our premium. God bless you. Jesus.